All right, you can grab a seat. You can grab a seat. Welcome, Treeline. Uh, if you are new here uh, and we have not met, my name is David. I'm the lead pastor here, and it is so fun. Thanks. Yeah, it's great. Uh, I'm on staff here. It's fun. Okay. I am so excited about today because next week we're starting a new series uh, in the Psalms, okay? So if you're like, whoa, the Psalms, that's great. We're doing that. And I, also, it's a sweet series in some sense for summer because we know that a lot of you just are not going to be around every week, right? We've got cottages, we've got vacations. It feels like every week you're like, wait, who's here? What's going on? Summertime in Michigan, get your son while you can. And so we were going to do the Psalms. And so what's really fun about that is even if you're not able to be here through the whole series, you know, you can catch up on the podcast for the weeks you meet. But every single week is just going to be like a Psalm. So this next week is Psalm 1. And the Psalms are kind of these tight packaged things. Each week is going to be a little bit different, but I'm really excited for that. But I wanted to, before we move on from Matthew, I wanted to kind of um, have a last hurrah, if you will, okay? So if you've been at Treeline, you know this book, the book of Matthew, has really shaped the life of our church since we started. When we started Treeline Church, like the very kind of first or one or two weeks in, like we started the Gospel of Matthew, and for the last year and a half, almost two years, we've been just going through the book, looking at the life of Jesus almost every single week. And it's been really transformative. And so one of the things I wanted to do before we kind of ended our study of Matthew is I wanted to kind of go back and like put some flags in the ground for us, right? There were so many different things I think we learned about Jesus, so many things that I really do feel like shaped our lives, also shaped our church. And I wanted to kind of just take a day and go back and remember those things together. Um, and I was thinking about this sermon, and there was a few different ways I was going to structure it. You know, I was just telling Andrew, one of the ways I thought about structuring it was to do like 23 points and just go 28 and go through like the whole, you know, the whole entire book. Like chapter one, we learned this, chapter two. And I was like, there's no way I could keep each of those points to a minute. And so I was like, that's going to be a two hour long sermon. Let's not do that. Um, although someday, maybe, uh, just not on a Sunday morning. And, you know, but I also thought maybe we do like a really just, clear, cohesive outline. Like, man, here are like the key points you need to know about Jesus. And so someone coming in for the first time, this would be like a perfect sermon for you if you weren't with us for the last year and a half. But then I started thinking about the kind of conversations that I love to have around a fire with friends at night. Um, I don't know if you guys like fires, but I love fireside chats. And the kind of people I love being around a fire with, new people for sure, it's a great way to make friends and kind of get to know people. But it is a great thing to do with people that you have been friends with for a really long time, right? And what ends up happening when you're around a fire or like, you know, just kind of hanging out with a group of people who've known each other for a really long time is you start telling the stories, right? Like the stories that define your group, right? Like you're sitting around a fire and all of a sudden someone's like, oh my gosh, Hunt, remember that time? We went backpacking and we told you not to wear boots like that weren't, you know, broken in. And you were like, that's dumb. I'll do what I want. And then like a mile into the backpacking trip, you had like the world's largest blister. That's why we call you Blisterfoot now from ever. And so you start to tell the stories, right? Of like just the stories that define your journey together, your life together. And it isn't necessarily the most cohesive stories or the things that best outline. And in some sense, if you're like a new friend sitting in on the circle, you wouldn't even be able to walk away and be like, I don't even know why these people are friends. These are just like a bunch of iconic moments in their past. And so that's this morning, okay? This morning is like a fireside chat with friends where we're gonna just remember what were some of the moments that we had with Jesus over the last two years that have really defined us. Moments that felt like there were just like something powerful that morning where Jesus met us in a unique way. And, and I don't, as, as your pastor, I don't want us to be the kind of people who have these powerful moments with Jesus, and then just kind of move on with our lives. But I wanted to have today is a, is a little bit of a way for us to kind of remember who Jesus is, what we learned about him. And for some of us actually to have a moment where you put a flag in the ground and say, I need to not just know this about Jesus, I need to remember this. And I need to continue to let this shape the way I live for the rest of my life. So we do not have 28 points, but we got eight, all right? And I promise the last four are shorter than the first four. So halfway through this, you're going to be like, what in the world? Um, don't worry. It will not be forever long sermon. But here's the first point. Here's the thing that we learned about Jesus that I think we came face to face with in Matthew is this. Jesus is a king. First point, Jesus is a king. Um, 
Matthew opens up. Anyone remember the first line, how Matthew opens up? It's kind of weird. It's, it starts this. It says, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, son of David, son of Abraham. Matthew 1 starts with a royal bloodline, a lineage. And from the very beginning through the end of the book, one of the things Matthew's presenting over and over is this idea saying, hey, Jesus is not just a teacher. He's not just a prophet. He's not just a rabbi. He is the incoming king. Matthew 2, the very next chapter, you see there's these kings from the east who bring uh, gifts to him. And you also have the beginning of this tension that Jesus coming as the king means there's this tension between him and everyone who occupies a place of power and authority now. And so his family ends up on the run from King Herod. And so from the very beginning of his life, everything about him is an affront to like the current systems and rulers of the day. And the lineage that Jesus has given, there's two really remarkable things about it. I don't know if you remember this, but the very first thing is that it is like a, a lineage that's not sanitized or kind of like cleaned up. It's just presented with all the brokenness and sin that's attached with a normal human family lineage. Like there's, I mean, there's, there's incest, there's sexual assault, there's prostitutes in his history, there's like familial abuse, there's all kinds of things that you'd be like, if you're telling the story of a king, you'd be like, let's like cut all that out and make this look really good. Jesus is like, no, I'm being born into the line of humanity and humanity is marked with sin and brokenness. Therefore, this is now my story. This is my lineage too. But the other thing is that his lineage is traced all the way back to Abraham. And Abraham is this guy all the way back in Genesis 12 who was promised that through this guy and through his family, God was somehow going to set right everything that was now wrong in the world. And so Matthew goes, yeah, he's a king. He's born in the line of humanity. And this is actually the guy who's born to set everything straight. And then we get to Matthew 4. And this is right after Jesus' baptism. Jesus is going to go into the wilderness, be tempted by the devil. Maybe you remember this scene, like iconic scene, right? Satan is kind of going toe to toe with Jesus. And there's this temptation that comes and Jesus stands Firm, And one of the things that we see from the beginning of Jesus' ministry is he's not just a teacher or leader. He's not just starting a new kind of religion, but actually Matthew's making it clear. He's saying it's not just that he's a king, but the type of king he is, he's coming to start not just a kingdom in some kind of local place. He's actually coming to start a new humanity. He's overturning the story of the world. He didn't come to redirect a creation gone wrong, but he came as the first member of an entirely new creation. And so in Matthew 4, you see Jesus retelling the story of Adam and Eve. And this time where Adam fell and brought the world with him, Jesus would be victorious. Adam and Eve gave in. Jesus would hold his ground. You see, Adam and Eve, they're tempted in the garden of God and they're cast into the wilderness. And now Jesus stands in our wilderness and he actually ushers in the kingdom of God. So Jesus is a king, but he's starting a new humanity. And the very next thing you see is he goes, all right, who wants in? And he goes, and he's walking along the shore on the Sea of Galilee, and he finds the most likely characters imaginable, right? <laughs> two fishermen named Peter and Andrew. Like two nobodies, like people that have no business being anywhere near the kingdom of God. These aren't like the best students kind of from the synagogues that have worked really hard to be close to God. They're the ones who probably got kicked out early and are now just like fishermen. Like they're just kind of doing their own thing. And Jesus goes, you're going to be perfect for my kingdom. And he goes over to him and he just says, follow me. And so he begins to form this band of disciples. And in Matthew 5 through 7, you have the Sermon on the Mount. And, and he begins to teach all these huge crowds of people what kingdom, what the kingdom of heaven looks like. And one of the things we learn in many ways, it's opposite of how the kingdom of this world looks. We find out that those who are actually the top of the kingdom of this world, those who have riches, who oppress, those who kind of get to the very top are actually people at the bottom of the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus keeps answering this question, what is the blessed life? What is the good life? What is actually the right mountain to spend your life climbing as a human being? And in the Sermon on the Mount, the thing that becomes clear is most of us are climbing the wrong mountain. And even if we get to the top of it, we find out that's not the place we're actually looking for. What he does in the Sermon on the Mount is he describes what life would be like if we didn't view God as some kind of distant ruler or judge in the sky, but what would it look like to actually live your life with God as Father? And when he ends that sermon, the crowds are so astonished, they've never heard anyone teach or say anything like this, that they just walk away and they go, who is this man who teaches with this kind of authority? And this is the theme that started to just kind of hit us again and again in Matthew, that Jesus has authority. This is the second point. 
Jesus has authority. One of the things we see from the very beginning of the gospel is that Jesus teaches with authority, right? Everyone that comes to any of his like, teachings, they're like, what's going on? He's not like the scribes. He's not like these other religious guys. Like they're kind of summarizing for people's ideas. They're kind of reaching out, grasping for what might be true. Jesus stands up and in some profound way is telling us with authority what is true about the world. And we've never seen anything like it. And so the crowds begin to build, right? Anyone who goes to one of Jesus' teachings and says, hey, you got to come listen to this guy. It's different. He's not like the others. And what happens as the story unfolds is that Jesus' words don't just have the authority to explain the world, but we find out that Jesus' words have the authority to remake the world. And there starts to be these profound miracles that start happening around Jesus, right? These lepers start to come to Jesus. These people have this like skin condition that makes them ritually unclean and cut off from the temple and the religious life of the community. And Jesus does something no one else would do. Everyone else is like, you stay away from these people because they'll, they're, their uncleanness will actually affect you. But Jesus walks to them and he touches them and he makes them clean. People begin to bring their sick, their blind, their lame to Jesus. And anyone who is sick is made well. Anyone who is blind is given back their sight. Anyone who has never taken a single step before because they've been paralyzed from birth, Jesus looks at them and says, stand up, rise, and walk. And they do. Whatever is wrong with the world is made right in the presence of Jesus. And so Jesus has this tremendous authority, but the thing he uses his authority to do is to heal and unwind everything that is broken about the world and broken about people's individual stories. Like, it's just incredible. And there's this moment in Matthew 8 where, like, the authority of Jesus is put on, like, the most kind of stark display. And I don't know if you remember this, but he gets into a boat and he crosses the Sea of Galilee, right? And it's one of these many times where, like, for whatever reason, whenever they're on the boat, there's storms <laughs> on the Sea of Galilee, right? And there's a storm, and it's a tremendous storm. And he's with professional fishermen, right? This is like half the people who are the close disciples of Jesus. That's what they did before they were disciples. And it's such a serious storm that these group of professional sailors and fishermen, they are terrified for their lives. Remember this? They're, they're crying out. They're screaming, Jesus, we are going to die. <laughs> And so you just put yourself in that moment, right? It is dark. It is at night. There are wind. There are waves. Like the storm is getting absolutely intense. The boat is capsizing. They're screaming. Remember what Jesus is doing? He's sleeping. <laughs> He's asleep. Like Jesus is so at peace in the middle of this storm. He is asleep. And the boat is being rocked around. It's like capsizing. I have no idea what that looked like, but his body's probably ragdolling around all over the place, right? Like, it's a wild scene. But I think it's a perfect picture of so much of our lives, right? We look at our lives and our world and our story, and it feels like the boat is filling with water. We are terrified, and we find ourselves crying out to God, do you not see what's happening here? Do you not care? And they wake Jesus up. And what's really amazing is he actually, the very first thing he does is he rebukes them. And he says, why are you so afraid? And they're like, we're sinking. <laughs> like, do look around. There's a storm. Like, our boat is going under. We are dying. And he says, why are you so afraid? Oh, you of little faith. And remember what Jesus does? He stands up in the boat and Jesus tells the winds and the waves to stop. And they do. And there's this great calm that comes over the Sea of Galilee and the clouds part and the suns come out and it's just clear. And you have all the disciples, like their bodies are laying around the boat. <laughs> They're drenched, soaking wet. And Jesus is just standing in the middle of them, and he's just told the world to stop, and it has. And Matthew 8, 27, this is their assessment. They say, what sort of man is this, that even the winds and the waves obey him? You see, there's many times in our lives where I think this picture describes our life perfectly. Our lives feel out of control, and it seems like Jesus is just asleep and unmoved. 
and we ask this question, does God really care about what's going on in my life? And I think the answer in Matthew again and again is that he really does care. He is just not afraid of the same kind of things that we are. This is one of the reasons we're afraid. And one of the reasons we come in here, and you might even have something, you come in today and you're like, I am afraid of this. Like I'm anxious, I'm fearful, I'm worried about this. And the question is, why does God not seem to be worried about that in the same way that you do? Well, the reason we're afraid is because the world is out of our control, but it's always under his. He has the authority. And so Jesus stands up in the boat and just demonstrates his authority by commanding the winds and waves to stop, and they do. And one of the questions that Matthew causes us to ask again and again is this. If the wind and the waves obey Jesus, and even the forces of darkness obey Jesus, do we? Do we? We're presented this idea that his words are not just suggestions. They're not kind of something to be kind of weighed and considered as though we are the ruler and judge of him, but actually they're meant to be responded to as the creation responds to the creator. And so you have this picture of the winds and the waves obeying him without hesitation immediately. Jesus says something, so the world corresponds to his voice. The question is, do we know Jesus's voice like that? Do we respond to Jesus in the same way that the rest of creation does? So he's the king, and he's this one who has authority. But one of the things that is most amazing is they're standing in this boat. They're looking at Jesus, and he's just calming the storms. Like he's representing, he is different than any person you've ever met in your entire life. He has power, authority that no one else ever has. And there's this moment, this thing starts to happen where people see the authority of Jesus, and they start to back themselves away from him because they recognize he is other than they. And even in the boat, they're actually terrified of Jesus. But the very next thing we learn is that Jesus is simultaneously the most powerful person in the world, and he's the most approachable person that's ever lived. This is the third point. Jesus is the friend of sinners. This is, the, this is a little bit longer point. This is the one that I think of everything in the Gospel of Matthew that has hit me hardest, and every time I come back to it, it just, it's like a breath of fresh air. It's this. Jesus is a friend of sinners. In Matthew 9, what happens right after this powerful display of his authority, do you remember the story that Matthew tells? He tells the story of when he first met Jesus. And this is Matthew's gospel, and so this is Matthew's story. And he goes, I want to tell you the story of what it was like when I met Jesus. And I'm actually going to read this part. I'm summarizing a lot of the book, but we're actually reading in Matthew 9. This is what it says. Matthew 9, 9, it says, As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. So he's gathering this group of disciples. He finds this guy who's a tax collector named Matthew. He says, hey, I want you in this crew. And he rose and he followed him. And as Jesus reclined at the table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners, they came and they were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, hey, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard it, he said, well, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. This is one of the iconic scenes of Jesus, isn't it? I mean, if you don't know anything about Jesus, the thing you know is he's not like a normal religious leader, right? He hangs out with people you'd normally not associate with Christian things or religious things, people that historically feel marginalized and cast out from religious circles. Jesus spends his time hanging out with people like that. And you have this moment with Matthew, one of his core 12 disciples. He was a tax collector, right? We're not going to get super into this, but man, if you were a tax collector in that day, it just basically meant you'd made some profoundly poor choices that made you rich but it also alienated you from every single other person that you were related to. And so his sin and his choices alienated him from the whole rest of society. And quite literally, Matthew would be somebody who everybody would hate openly, proudly, for who he had become and the kind of life he'd chosen to live. He was viewed as a very morally, like, horrible person. And here's what's interesting. Everybody has some corner of their life like this. If we're really honest, it might not be that this is your core identity, but there's some corner of your life, there's something that you bring with you wherever you go that alienates you from others, 
something that brings with it tremendous shame, something that you wish wasn't true of you, that you wish you could hide. And it's usually this part of us that we think most alienates us from God. But what Matthew says is he says, the moment I met Jesus, you know what was, what was happening? I was sitting in my tax booth. That's where he first laid eyes on me. Matthew says, Jesus found me in the one place I would have never wanted to be found. It's my place of greatest shame and regret. And that's where Jesus locked eyes with me. And it was in that place, I thought he would do what every single other religious leader ever would. They'd spit on the ground or they'd spit at me and cast me out of their presence once again. And this Jesus, this Christ, he invited me in. He asked me to follow him to be his disciple. And this, this moment where Matthew leaves his tax booth and he goes and follows Jesus, it begins to spread like wildfire because no one had ever seen anything like that. And it's all of a sudden this idea becomes powerful that sinners, even those who are the most sinful and the most broken and seemingly the most far from God, those people are safe in the presence of Jesus. This is why Jesus would be called a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners and prostitutes, because all of these people were the ones who started flocking to Jesus, because he was the one person in the world who made them feel safe in his arms. Man. I, mean, I don't know if you feel that way about Jesus, but there are things in my life that alienate me from so many people, things I want to hide, things I hate about myself. And the idea that when Jesus sees those things in me, they don't alienate him from me, but actually they draw him towards me. It's just a beautiful thing. I mean, many people think in order to come to church, to come to God, you need to clean yourself up first. But Jesus makes it absolutely clear. He says, no, 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 I don't want you to clean yourself up first. I want to meet you in that place of greatest shame because I'm the great friend of sinners. And these parts of our lives, they don't repel God from us, but it's actually true because of what happens in Jesus' life, that these are the very things in our life that actually draw the heart of God's love and mercy towards us the most. But one of the things Matthew does again and again, he's going he's gonna to paint Jesus as the great friend of sinners. But he doesn't want us to misread gentleness for weakness. Right? He, he, this is why it starts with authority, because it's the same one who's strong enough to cast out demons, the same one who's actually commands the winds and the waves and he speaks to the dead and raises them to life, that is the same one who is so tender and warm and approachable that even the most wounded and broken feel safe by his side. I mean, there's just something about Jesus that we read and just came face to face with over and over again that you just can't help be drawn by his presence. Like there's something about Christ that you couldn't get any of the synagogues. Because everybody had a religious space. They had a church. They had like a normal place where you could go and kind of hang out with these kind of pious religious people. But it was something you got with Jesus that was different. But it also wasn't what he got with his normal friends. There's actually something about Jesus you can't find anywhere else. It's not religion. It's also not a blank check of affirmation. It's not a group of friends who go, well, I don't judge you because I'm doing the same dumb stuff you are, right? It's like you can get like affirmation from a group of friends that you're like, this doesn't mean anything because we're all kind of dumb. <laughs> no, Jesus is different. Jesus is holy. Like he's holy, holy, holy. There's no human being has ever stood next to anything more pure or holy or perfect or more set apart from us than Jesus Christ. And yet... This holy Jesus lays down at a meal with sinners. He drinks wine and shares the same bowls with prostitutes. He probably even laid his head down on the chest of Matthew, this tax collector, just in intimacy. This is a man who has no boundaries with sinners. He never holds them at arm's length. He only embraces them when they come to him. And that means he has no boundaries with us. It means there's not a single part in Jesus' heart that when you come to him hoping for an invitation, he never puts his hand out and says no. He always only says yes to sinful people pleading for mercy. And this is what he does because this is what he's like. And one of the things that the New Testament is doing is it's actually saying with clarity 
This is what Jesus does because this is what God is like. This is who God is. He is both a hurricane and he is the softest, most tender whisper. He's holy. He's set apart. He's other than you, and yet he invites us in. We're not cast out for the things that most shame us, but we're embraced even right in the middle of them. And one of the things Matthew wants us to do over and over again is he's like, I want you to behold Jesus. Like the uniqueness of this man. He's not like another king. He doesn't have the same kind of authority anyone else is, and he doesn't have the same kind of limits with people that everybody else does. There's only one who could truly condemn us. His name is Jesus Christ, and he's actually the one who invites us in. There's only one who could actually cast us out, but this is the one who embraces us. This is the one who lays his head on our chest because he isn't offended by us. Behold Jesus, the great friend of sinners. And I'm stunned by this. And even I was writing this last night, I, I feel stunned by it again. How can God really be like this? Like, I don't know if you feel that way, but I was just like going back and I was just like remembering what Jesus is like. We've been learning about him. And I just again and again feel like, is it possible that this is true? Like, is it possible that God is actually this approachable, this warm, this inviting to people like me? How can God not be the very first one that is out of reach when I sin? That feels natural. It feels normal that when I sin, God's the very first person that's off limits. But Jesus says something totally different. Actually, he says, no, that he's actually the very last person. The very last person who would still be within our reach even after we've lost everything else. I mean, this is powerful. Like, it's powerful. I mean, I know some of you in the room, your sin has alienated you from a lot of people. Your sin has made your life really hard. I mean, right now, I know that it's making your marriage hard. <laughs> the person you're with is like, I love this person, but dang, their sin sucks. It wounds me. It's hard. I mean, Jesus, when the whole rest of our world would be pushed away by our arrogance or our pride or our lies, our abuse, when we would have nothing left, the message of Jesus says that the one thing we would always have on the table is the invitation of God into close relationship with him. That is crazy. So Jesus is the friend of sinners. But here's point four. Jesus isn't just a friend, but his invitation is for us to come close actually come all the way in. This is Matthew 14. There's another storm at sea. Uh, and in the most casual way possible, Jesus just shows up walking on the water, right? You guys remember this, right? Like Jesus is like, yeah, you guys are in trouble. I'll come get you. And he comes walking on the water in the middle of the night. And we talked about this. One of the most incredible kind of scenes in the Bible, this symbolic moment, kind of looking back to Genesis, where the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters, darkness is over the deep. This kind of iconic image, all of a sudden Jesus in the darkest part of night comes hovering over the waters. And Jesus is there and the disciples once again are like, Jesus, we're dying, right? And he says, do not be afraid. But then what he says is interesting. He says, I am, right? And we lose it in some of our translations, but he's literally, he's proclaiming the name of God, like Yahweh, like I am who I am. He, he takes the, the holy name of God and kind of claims it as his identity in this moment as he's hovering above the waters, walking on water. He says, do not be afraid. I am. And this gives us a ton of clarity. It's like, okay, well, the reason the wind and the waves obeyed Jesus earlier is because this is the dude who created the winds and the waves, right? Like they remembered his name. They're like, oh yeah, that's the guy who spoke us into existence. In this moment, the Bible's saying, Jesus is not just a great teacher. He's not just a king. He's the great I am. He's the eternal one. He's the one who cannot be defined by anything other than himself. I am who I am. In this moment, Jesus is saying, yes, I'm human. Yes, I'm for real. Yes, you can reach out and touch me. Yes, I'm the friend of sinners. But I am the eternal, unchanging God. That's what happens when Jesus is walking on water. And then you have maybe the most stunning moment in the whole New Testament. In the beginning of this powerful moment, Peter starts talking. <laughs> okay. 
like, instead of just shutting up and being like, wow, this is amazing, Peter's like, I have a question, right? <laughs> Peter begins talking in this moment. And what Peter says to Jesus out in the middle of the darkness floating on the water is he says, Jesus, is it really you? And if it's really you, would you tell me to come to you? He makes this plea for relationship, right? He's like, if that's you, I want to be where you are. Can you tell me to come and be with you where you are right now? And this moment seems completely inappropriate, all right? Like Jesus is hovering on the water. He just proclaimed the holy name of God as his true identity. Who could possibly be so bold and audacious and foolish in this moment to try to join Jesus where he is? The answer is Peter. That's who. But when Peter asks Jesus if he can come to him, Jesus does not rebuke him. He does not ignore him. He says one word. Do you remember what it is? Come. And Peter gets out of the boat, and he walks on the water to Jesus. And there's more to the story, right? Eventually his faith will fail him. He'll start sinking. But then one of the things we see is that the more the glory of God is revealed in Jesus, the gulf between us and him doesn't get larger, but actually the more we're revealed of who Jesus is, the more we're invited in. There is no line that we are not to cross with Jesus. There's no request that's actually too audacious. There's no curtain that actually would keep us from his innermost circle. Jesus doesn't invite us as fans. Do you realize that? He's like, I have no desire for you to be part of the crowd. I only want you to be part of my inner circle called disciples. I'm not calling anyone to come to my rally. I'm calling people to follow me with their life, join my inner circle, be joined to me. Come with me everywhere I go. Do everything I do. I don't want this authority just for myself. I want to share it with you as my followers to go into the world and change things. At every moment of our lives with Jesus, we come to him. We see him more clearly for who he really is. There seems to be this gap that further expands. Jesus is up here. We are down here. But every single moment, Jesus says, come. Come further. Come further. Come closer. Come closer. We are those who are invited to get out of the boat and live a life with Jesus that makes no sense outside of the power of God. And if we're gonna come close to Jesus, we actually have to let him get close to us. You see, Jesus invites us to be close to him so that he can actually transform us. This is the fifth, the fifth thing we saw, is that Jesus is the one who transforms us. You know, Jesus has authority, and his authority is to basically come and bring a revolution. And it's interesting, the revolution that Jesus brings is not the revolution we would expect. It's one of the things that's actually really hard about following Jesus is sometimes he is not who we would expect him to be. And if we're honest, sometimes Jesus is not who we want him to be. Matthew 11, there's this powerful moment with John the Baptist. John the Baptist is the first person we're introduced to in the, in the book, and he basically prepares the way for Jesus. He's Jesus' biggest fan. Like, he says, follow that guy. He's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, right? He points to Jesus and says, he's it. He's the dude. And then in Matthew 11, John's life has not gone according to plan. He prepared the way for Jesus, but now he is in prison, and he's looking forward to his death. His life has become really, really hard. And he sends his followers to Jesus and just says, Jesus, like, are you, are you it? Like, is this, are you the real guy? Because this is not what I thought was going to happen. And here's the great tension, not just for John, but for all followers of Jesus. Every single person, when there's a redeemer, a savior, every person can raise their hands and say, okay, great, I need saving from these things. And everybody can point to the injustice and the evil everything that's wrong with our own life. And we want Jesus to get rid of these things from our world and from our lives now, on our timeline and in our way. But what we find is that Jesus is actually fighting a deeper battle than that. And this is a really hard tension in following Jesus. Because instead of a Messiah who just comes and fights our enemies for us, we have a Messiah who actually enters into our tragedy and suffers alongside us. But also, one of the greatest things that Jesus came to wage war with is not the enemies out there, but actually they're the enemies in here. 
Matthew 21, there's this iconic scene as Jesus clearing the temple. And it's interesting, he gets to Jerusalem and everybody's like, dude, you're it, you're the hero, you're the Messiah. You're gonna come and wage war against these oppressive Romans. And then Jesus gets into the city and do you know where he goes? He doesn't go to the seat of power and say, we're going to war with you. He goes into the heart of the city, into the temple. And he begins to flip over tables because he goes, the real thing that's most broken here is what's happening in the heart of God's people. There's so much noise and idolatry and distraction happening that I cannot even begin to try to bring salvation to this place until I clear all of it out. And so that's what Jesus does. He just starts flipping over the tables of the money changers. He needs to get everything out of here. And it's only after he gets everything out that he can begin healing. And often this is what it looks like when Jesus comes into our lives. It's actually one of the most like confusing things about following Jesus, I think, because you're like, I need salvation. Help me, Jesus. Yes. And then all of a sudden, many of the things that have become things we hold very near and dear to us, Jesus seems to begin to wage war against those things. And we're like, Jesus, I wanted you to protect these things. And he's like, look, I can't protect those things because those have now taken place on the throne of your heart. And that's only where I belong. And Jesus, he's this king, but he's the king who's come to lay claim to all that's his. And one of the things that's his is the throne of our lives. And so Jesus comes in and he lays claim as the right authority, the true son of God. And one of the questions in our lives is whether we will be the kind of people who will lay down our swords and surrender our lives and our hearts to Jesus as king, or whether we will join the crowds who seek to crucify the one who seeks to take our place on the throne. You see, what matters is whether you bow your knee and surrender your life to Jesus or whether we end up fighting with him for the title that's rightfully his. This is one of the tensions in the Christian faith is that so often we end up in these battles with Jesus where we're like, Jesus, why aren't you saving me? Why aren't you helping me? Why aren't you protecting me? Why aren't you redeeming me? You have these promises. Where are you? And Jesus is like, I'm trying to do that. And you are making it so hard because you won't let go of the very things that are wounding and killing your soul. And one of the things we have to do as followers of Jesus is we have to actually let go of those things, place them on the altar and say, Jesus, heal me. Anything I hold dear is yours. Take whatever you can. I just want you. I want your salvation. And I believe you know how to give it to me. So invites us to be close to him so that we can be transformed by him. But here's the last question. How does Jesus actually do that? Well, this is the sixth thing, is that Jesus is the one who joins himself to us. There's this parable in Matthew 22. This is a very interesting parable. It's, it's about the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like a wedding feast thrown by the king for his son. And there's this really interesting moment where he sends out all these invitations, like, come to the feast, come to the feast. And then all of a sudden, there's this huge group of people from everywhere, like every corner of planter are seemingly like in there. And they're like, how do we get invited to this feast? This is amazing. And there's somebody in there that doesn't have a wedding garment on. You guys remember this story, right? And what does Jesus do? Jesus casts him out of the party. And it's this kind of crazy thing. And you're like, oh my gosh, like, what is this wedding garment I have to have? And the thing that becomes clear is this. Every single person who's a guest at the party of Jesus, every single person who's invited into the kingdom of God are not just people who are invited to the party, but they're the ones who are actually invited to stand up at the altar and be joined to the king's son. Why do you need a wedding garment? Well, you're not a guest. You're in the ceremony. You're not just someone who's invited in. You're not just someone who's invited in close. You're the one that God has chosen to join himself to. And this is why we need to be clothed in something that we don't have. And eventually, at the end of Matthew, you get to the cross. And what you end up seeing in the cross is that God has chosen somehow, despite everything that makes any logical sense, our God in love has chosen to join himself faithfully and forever to a group of sinful, flawed, broken people. And you ask the question, what is the cost of that love that God has for people like us? And the answer is the cross of Jesus Christ. 
You see, on the cross, what Jesus will do is he will take the place of sinners. He will take their name. He will take their story. He will take their punishment on his shoulders so that all those who've been joined to Jesus through faith might be able to take his name, his story, and his reward on ours. The very end, it talks about baptism, right? It says, go and baptize people in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's this naming ceremony that's just meant to say, hey, you as a follower of Jesus are named out of the name of Adam and into the name of Christ, right? This, this Jesus who's starting a new humanity is inviting you not to just have a different life, is literally inviting you to be part of a new story, no longer part of the old humanity, but now part of the new humanity defined by Jesus, We are those who now belong to the triune God. And what we find at the end of Jesus' life is this, is that on the cross, Jesus basically takes our names, our sin, our story, and it is carved into his body so that at the end of his life, he might be able to take us and he might be able to carve his story and his name into ours. Jesus is the one who unites himself to us And Jesus is the one who now sends us. You who have met the king, you who have experienced the power and the authority and it's begun to change your life, you you who found Jesus to be a friend of sinners who has invited you into his inner circle, you who have been transformed, like you as a Christian who've been joined to Jesus, Jesus in Matthew 28 says, now go and tell others. Go and make disciples. Go and baptize people in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit because this isn't just for you. This is the new story that everybody can be part of. This is not just for you. This is not just for the elite. This is for anyone who would want a different story and a different name. And then this is the last point eight, is this is the God who is with us. Jesus is the God who's with us. Matthew 1, it starts by kind of declaring the name of God, right? It comes to Joseph in a dream and says, his name will be Emmanuel, which means God with us. And then what's the very last thing we're told in Matthew? Jesus says, I am with you to the very end of the age. See, this Jesus didn't stay dead, but he is alive. And he's now the one who has the authority to raise everything that is dead to life. And the very last thing we see is Jesus saying, I am with you. I will always be with you. There's nothing in this world that can separate you from my love or my love from you. And so I just want you right now this morning to just take a breath. Take a quick breath. I know that was a lot. We just went through. But I want you to just breathe in the goodness of Jesus today. Like, I don't know if you feel this way, but like, I am stunned by who Jesus is. Like, I can't believe that that's true, that that's actually what God is like. This is who Jesus is. And no matter what the world might take from us, they can't take Jesus. He's the one person who will always be with us. Let me pray for us. We're going to take communion together in a minute. But Jesus, we have had an amazing couple years learning about you. And Jesus, you've shaped us in so many ways. God, you have brought so many of us out of different kinds of slaveries. God, there's there's so many people that came into this with broken relationship with God, and you've begun to heal that. God, so many of us have had areas of sin that have been hurting and wounding us, and you, through your power and your authority, you've called us out of that over this last year. Jesus, there's so many of us that thought that we were the ones who were cast off. We were the ones who were kept far away, that we had no standing with God because of who we were, and we met you, and you said, no, no, you're mine. No, I claim you. No, there's a different story that's now going to be written over your life. Jesus, you change everything. Because you are real and because you exist, our world is a different place. And our stories are beautiful. God, would you help us be people that always remember who you are and what you've done? We're going to take communion this morning. And every couple weeks at Tree Line, we take communion and... We try to put a little bit of a different spin on it each week, right? We don't want it to feel mundane or just so routine that it loses its meaning. 
we're going to take communion today. And I feel like we have an opportunity to just remember all these things in communion. Because in communion, one of the things that you're doing is you're, you're coming to Jesus as the king and you're like declaring your allegiance to him. You're saying, Jesus, I'm yours. You're the king. You're the right king of this world, the right king of my, my heart. I, I'm submitting my life to you through this symbolic act. But also you're coming to Jesus as the one who has authority. You look out in the whole world, there's no one who can actually give you what you need, but Jesus has the authority to give you grace and mercy. And so when we take communion, we come to the one who can actually heal us totally and completely. In communion, we come to the one who is a friend of sinners. Like not the one who holds us at arm's length, but actually we come to Jesus in our sin and our brokenness. We take our mask off and we just come to Jesus as the real us and we find ourselves not pushed away, but called in for healing. Jesus is the one who asks us to come close, right? Jesus says, no, I don't just wanna save you through this kind of spoken word from a distance. I want you to eat my flesh and drink my blood. Be joined to me. I want you in my inner circle. This is an opportunity for us to say yes to that. Yes, Jesus, I wanna come close. The closer I come, the more I'm gonna be healed. Jesus is the incoming king. It's an opportunity for us to just once again take everything in our lives that occupies the throne, take it off the throne, put it on the altar and say, Jesus, would you take your rightful place in my life? It's an opportunity to remember that Jesus has joined himself to us. We're united with him to remember that we're the sent ones, we're the ambassadors, those with the name of Jesus on our foreheads. And it's an opportunity to remember that Jesus is with us literally right now. Jesus is with us. He is with you. And we get an opportunity to rehearse and remember and tell ourselves that truth as we take communion this morning.